listening to The Savvy Musician Show with Leah McHenry, and this is your secret weapon for success in the new music industry. Welcome, everyone, to today's show. I am so excited to have a guest with us. His name is Friedemann Feindeisen. Oh, no, I butchered it. I butchered it. Fin- <laughs> oh, Feindeisen. <laughs> Okay, you tell me what it is. It's Fint Eisen. And I would have let you sweat a little bit longer for than that, actually. <laughs> Fint Eisen. Yeah, it's, it's great. Okay. I it's would have Friedman. Yeah. It's Friedman, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited to have him here today because he is really an expert in a topic that's so important and so foundational to making anything that we talk about on this podcast working at all. And that is songwriting songwriting what makes a good song what makes people even want to listen to your song how do you know if it's a good song how do you know if the production is any good all of these different factors and so much more he is an expert and he's literally got it down to a science and i have been reading through his book that's called the addiction formula and we're going to talk about that today welcome to the show friedman can you give us a little nutshell version of who you are and what you do sure thing thanks for having me first of all um so yeah, as, as you said, Pliedemann Findeisen from Germany. That's why the German name. I have a YouTube channel called Holistic Songwriting and a whole school that is attached to that, but YouTube is where most people know me from. Um, I have a series called The Artist Series where I look at different artists and how they connect songwriting with marketing. So I'm really interested in uh, that general connection between marketing and the songs. So how can we make our songs more commercial? And I wrote a book about that as well called The Addiction Formula, as I said, which is about a a certain formula that I figured out over years that is being used not just in pop music, but in commercial music in general. So we talked a little bit before this podcast that it's also being used in metal. And there's a lot of genre where this is being used. So this is a general um, approach to writing songs that makes sure that you're kind of taking your listener by the hand a little bit more, guiding them through the song, helping them along a little bit more wherever that is needed. That's kind of what that is about. And the whole thing is called holistic songwriting because uh, I don't just look at the songwriting. As I said, I'm looking at the whole picture. I'm really interested, not just in the techniques, but I'm interested in, as I said, the marketing. I'm also interested in music videos and everything that's attached to that. So everything from lighting to image to, yeah, everything like that really. That is awesome and fascinating. And I never thought of songwriting in like a holistic experience. And what does, can you explain to us a little bit more what the holistic part of it is? And yeah, let's start there. Sure. So for example, uh, in the addiction formula, um, I talk about this formula that makes your songs a little bit easier to understand, therefore a little bit easier to market. So it's easier to connect to your songs if they follow a certain blueprint let's say so it's almost like a it's almost like a key to your um listener's brain in a way in that it uses a formula that's being used all over media so it's not just being used in music but it's being used in presentations in movies in um stories in general of course so books and stuff like that and um that's really what i'm interested in is making that connection between the songwriting and everything that is around it. So I think, for example, another aspect would be inner game. So your mental physique, like how are you doing as a person? You know, it's really hard to write good songs if you're not feeling great. And um, I've been coaching a couple of people that really have tried very hard to write happy pop songs, but they were in the largest, largest depression of their life. And that's not going to work. You know, you need a certain mindset to write certain songs. And so it's about that. It's about um, making sure that you look right in your videos. I think you're really good at that. You know, your, uh, your artwork and your pictures on Instagram, everything fits together really well with your music. It's all very clearly one image. Like you've very clearly defined your micro niche. And so I'm interested in that. Like, how does that translate to music? Like, are there certain things I can do with my songs to make them sound more, let's say Celtic metal? You know, are there certain things that I can do that um, that will detract from that. Like how far can I lean out of the window, so to say, to still stay within that realm? 
And I'm also interested in things like using the right, even the right fonts or using the right lighting in your video. Like um, in the Adele video, for example, I think it's called How Adele Markets Herself or something like that. Um, I talk about lighting and how her lighting's changed over the years as her image has changed slightly. You know, so that's something that I think is really um, important. And I think a lot of people overlook it amongst other things. So. Um, so that's really the a broad view of everything. I'm really looking at every little detail of your career to make sure that the image that you're putting out, that you're putting forward is congruent and makes sense. And it, again, it's like that key to someone's brain. Once they understand what you're doing and you're firing on all cylinders, the same message, then it becomes really easy to, um, to, to win people over if they un if they understand all the that message if they agree with that message that's awesome i love that video by the way I, I was saying before we jumped on to this recording that i got sucked into your channel <laughs> and <laughs> i went there for a different reason and then I, I i couldn't stop watching it and the adele one was one of the ones i watched and it was super fascinating and i just thought wow your analysis is like you know it's it's kind of it's eerily accurate and pointing out things that I don't think the average person would ever really notice unless you did point it out that way. Really interesting. Definitely go check out his YouTube channel. Um, and it's holistic songwriting, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so this is awesome. And there's, I have some questions for you and you know, one of them, hang on a second, there's an airplane. <laughs> there's like a small airport nearby and I don't know if you can hear it, but anyway, yeah. So my area of expertise is marketing, online marketing, curriculum, different, different things like that. And I always tell my students that you can't market crappy music. You just can't, you have the best marketing strategy in the world. And if the, if the music is mediocre, if there's no demand for it, you're going to have a really hard time getting yeah. traction. So it all begins with having excellent music that's in demand and excellent music means the song itself. And then also the production side. Can you tell us what, actually makes a good song how do you know if your song is any good so to me there's three pillars of a really great song um, it's a great hook so making sure that you have a melody that stands out and is catchy it's uh, a good groove which is maybe less important in certain niche genres and uh, it's the lyricless storytelling which is what i talk about in the addiction formula because Two of those three things, I think you can, you can find in pretty much every hit song of the last 30 years. So you might have a song that doesn't have all three, but uh, at least two of the three, you, you will find in pretty much all of the songs. And there's two less important ones, I think, uh, that are production, even though that's really gaining fast. And I think especially in the pop world, production has become almost a fourth pillar. And lyrics, although I feel like that's declining. Like that's, I was uh, hoping you'd say reverb because I'm a bit of a <laughs> reverb freak. Reverb, yeah, that to me is part of production. So like the whole music production behind it, finding the right sounds, finding um, you know the right synths to use or the right vocal production, all of that to me is part of production. So the, the sound in general. Um, yeah, so, so those are the, the three main pillars and the two other ones that I think are also really important. Okay, so let's say I'm like, okay, I think I have these things but I don't know if they're good enough. Like when, what do you recommend when someone writes a song? Do you have a process for how to determine, Hey, this one's a winner or a loser? It's really difficult. It's really difficult to figure out whether your songs are actually good. And I have that challenge as well. Like it's not just beginners, but I've been writing songs for, you know, um, well, a decade now, over a decade. And I still have that challenge. I don't know who to trust on that, you know, because I have friends who are great musicians who don't understand my styles and I have people who don't understand the music that I write. And I have people who understand my music, but they have problems voicing their opinion or giving valid feedback. So it's, it's really difficult to find the right people that have the, your best interest in mind. Um, but that's the way I generally go is like I show my music to people that I think understand my music, that are also qualified enough to be able to voice their, um, their opinions, you know? So it doesn't have to be necessarily musicians. Like my mom is one of my favorite people to go to because she just, I mean, she understands me as a person, obviously, because we're probably very much alike. Um, and so she understands my music to a certain degree. And so it doesn't have to be professional musicians, but 
I rely on people to, to tell me whether something is actually good. And I don't really think too much about what they say, although that's certainly a part of it. But what I'm mostly looking for is reactions. And um, so, I mean, I'm not lying when I say like the, the reactions that I'm hoping for are people crying or people smiling in all the right places. And that's, I do see that with the songs that mean the most to me. I see that with people as well. Like when I show them to people, I do see people crying or do you see people smiling or stuff like that or, you know, laughing out loud. And that's really fun. That's when I know I have a song that actually works. Um, whereas the songs where people listen very intently and are very quiet throughout the song and say, at the end, they might say like, oh, this was very good. I know like something's not right. It might be expertly crafted, but doesn't have what it needs. Because ultimately what we're all doing is we're trying to package emotion into music. That's really what it's all about. It's not about the techniques. It's not about showing off your skill or um, how trained you are. And I mean, I have uh, a bachelor of music, but it's, I, all the information that I've learned during my studies is, I mean, I almost, I try to use as little of it as possible and try to really focus on how can I bring out the emotion? How can I make people feel something? Yeah, that's spectacular advice. Uh, I, you know, whenever I'm wondering about something, whether it's a t-shirt design or, you know, trying to figure out what the genre is for this album or whatever, my default is the three F's, friends, family, and fans almost like a study group, you know, um, whenever a big company goes to launch a product, they don't just put it out there to the entire world. They usually have a focus group of a small amount of people that they'll, you know, let them test it, try it, and they'll film the reactions. So it's unbiased, right? And I love that you brought that up because I almost think that musicians might be in some cases, the wrong people to show your music to, because we instantly go to, how can it be improved? Where are all the flaws? Oh, you played out of time there. We were, cause we're very self-critical type of people. We were perfectionists, I should say. And I feel like almost showing like a family member or a friend or a small group of, of like a focus group of fans, perhaps maybe getting that reaction from them would be the most genuine way to find out, is this the right direction that I'm going in or, you know, that sort of thing. So that's, that's a great piece of advice right there. Cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, I have a question about your book because it's very, I almost want to call it scientific and it is called the addiction formula. And so you've got charts and graphs in there. And I was really impressed with how you put all of that together in such a, yeah, kind of sciencey way. But at the same time, I love that you keep bringing it back to, Hey, this is art, this is a craft, uh, but it's an art and a science, right? And these formulas have proven to produce hit after hit after hit over a period of decades. And so what would you say to the person who is like, well, I am not pop artist. You know, I am, my goal is not to appeal to the, the widest audience possible. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? Well, I think there's a number of things I would say to them. First of all, who are you writing for is probably the biggest question that I would probably answer, uh, ask them back. Um, if you're not writing for others, are you just writing for yourself? That's fine as well, but most people have someone that they're writing for. And if they're interested in making those songs a little bit more understandable, and that's really all I'm, I'm trying to do with the book is to make the songs a little bit easier to follow without... Um, taking out all of the artistic integrity and stuff like that. Cause I think that's holy to us musicians. And I think that shouldn't ever be touched. You know, that's so, so important that the song stays creative and fresh and that we get to try out our weird ideas and to experiment. And I want to retain all of that. Um, but I think pushing it into a sort of girdle um, that makes it a little bit more compact, you know, tearing this, the seven and a half minute song down to a two and a half minute song is something I, I uh, do quite a lot when I give feedback. Um, that's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, also, you don't have to use the formula, but knowing it is gonna help. Even if you wanna go against the formula, that's fine. But understanding how it works will help you to do the opposite, even if you wanna do that. And also, I mean, there's plenty of genres that don't use this formula, you know, like um, instrumental music for a large part doesn't use the formula. There's, um, for example, South American music doesn't use the formula. There's a lot gaming of gaming uh, music. Gaming music, yeah. For example, yeah, and film music and all that kind of stuff. Music that has been where the structure is given by the medium that it uh, accompanies. 
all there's a lot of styles that don't use the formula but it's if you want to be commercial and with commercial I don't just mean if you want to sell out your music you know that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about how can you make music that people will like right and that doesn't mean you're you know cold-hearted um marketer because of that it just means hey you want your songs to be heard you want people to like your songs and at least to understand your songs then uh, this is a way to do that okay if you could give us one big juicy tip on how to make a song addictive what would that be no pressure <laughs> <laughs> oh that's tricky one thing well I would say, look at your tension. And with, so tension is a, is a word I redefine in the book because I don't think tension should just be used for harmony. I think tension is a much, should be used in a much broader sense of um, moving towards something. So if you have harmonic in, uh, tension, that means you're moving towards a tonic typically. So you're moving from a five to a one, from a dominant to, to a tonic. Um, I think, we need to expand that a little bit in to say, for example, a drum fill also creates tension, right? So if we have at the end of a section, the drummer goes, then that also is driving tension towards the one, the, to the, towards the downbeat of that next measure. And so there's a bunch of techniques in the book that um, outline things like that. Let me just click this off here. Um, and, uh, adding tension to your song, making sure that every section has a little bit of tension will ensure that your listener knows more is coming. We're going somewhere. Like that's the same thing as if you're writing a script for a movie, for example, you're always trying to add something in. that's going to foreshadow something, something new is going to happen. Like the big finale is coming, you know, and that's when we, what we want to do with our songs too. So in one word, it would be tension. Okay, that makes sense to me because with tension comes the the need for some kind of a resolve. Like if I don't get that, I feel very unsatisfied. It's like if you got up to the climax of a movie and then it just ended, exactly. you would feel like totally gypped and oh, maybe even angry. <laughs> so it's so important to have that resolve. So I love that. Can you quickly can walk I, us? Can I just, oh, can I yes. just very quickly say, because um, a lot of people are, often misunderstand me when I talk about tension. Tension does not mean it has to sound um, odd or weird or actually tense. Uh, tension or can- Augmented really, notes. <laughs> exactly, like it really doesn't refer just to harmony um, because a lot of people just really have that stuck in their head that it has to mean harmony. It really can mean anything from having a swoosh in an electronic production that goes, a production that goes, you know, that's also leading up to something to having a band playing a crescendo, maybe on a drum set going, gun, 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 gun. that's also driving you towards something. So it's all techniques like that. It doesn't, all these techniques are very commercial. And as I said, that's what the book is about. It's about mostly about writing commercial songs. And so I just wanted to clarify that real quick. No, that's great. Um, can you quickly walk us through what the formula is? And of course I encourage everybody to go get the book. It's on Amazon. And I think it's on your website as well. Uh, read the book because it obviously explains in so much more detail and in depth, but I think it would be super helpful. And I think people will definitely want to go get it when they hear what the basic framework is. Sure. Um, by the way, if you're getting the book, I recommend you get the audiobook because it has audio examples um, that are baked right into the text. So I rewrote the book slightly to, to fit those audio examples. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you're gonna get the book, I would say get the audiobook. First of all, the addiction formula is based on uh, energy curves. So that's my German way of trying to, to figure out how, how songs work, how commercial songs work. And in very simple terms, um, if we're looking at the energy distribution in a song, we can say that verses are generally low, choruses are generally high in energy, right? Now, the next step that I, that I took with the book was, so let's split this into a couple of sub factors. And I split energy into three other factors, and those are hype, tension, and implied tension. Now, I'm not going to talk about implied tension here because it's fairly complex, and for that, I really rather suggest you get the book. But hype and tension are something that is, that is fairly, people understand fairly quickly. So um, I, tension, I've kind of explained already, but let's explain it again. 
uh, hype is a relative energy level. So very simple in very simple terms, energy hype is low in your verses and hype is high in your choruses, right? And if you look at a curve that is just hype, um, you have this very blocky kind of curve. So it goes straight and then straight up to the next section and then straight over um, to the next section and then straight down to the next verse or something like that. So it's a very, it's a very blocky curve. And songs like that, so that's that's typically what you what you learn in other songwriting books as well, is to have like low choruses, high choruses, uh, low verses, high choruses. Um, and the next step I took was adding tension to that. So tension visually has is just ang it's the, the it angles the curve so you can smooth out those um that that blocky curve essentially so instead of going straight up to the next um to the next uh block to the next energy level you actually go there on a little ramp and um as i said those are techniques like adding fills or um going up with your vocals basically they're adding a timely element to your hype techniques so for example if i have um if I want to set a low hype level for my verse, I can uh, let my singer sing in a lower register. In the chorus, I let her sing, let her sing in a higher register. And if I want to add, turn that into a tension technique, I can just say, you know what, let's have her sing, start with a lower note and end her melody on a high note. So slowly going up a scale, for example, which is something you might hear, for example, in Ariana Grande's Problems, in, or pr Problem, I think uh, that's, that's the name of it. Um, the pre-chorus does something very much like that where it's building a lot of tension by her going up the scale, uh, up and up and up. So um, that is hype and tension. And I think the tension is really important, as I said, because it prepares us for what's about to happen. It foreshadows and um, lets us know that what we're hearing, hearing right now is not the end of it and there's more to come. So it builds anticipation. And if we have a strong enough uh, jump, in hype, jump, jump in hype after that, there's the satisfaction that comes from that. There's the, the payoff that we get from that. And I think that's really strong. It's that push and pull between um, anticipation and gratification in songs that I think makes um, the formula so strong. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, and if this is sounding a little abstract to people listening right now, it's just a matter of, go, like you said, go get the audiobook because there's so many examples in there. And then also, I was already finding your YouTube channel videos really, really helpful as well because you just, you literally show us with tons of different pop artists how they're actually doing it and breaking it down. So uh, really fantastic stuff. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, because I actually, we kind of got through a whole bunch of questions already really fast. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> is there anything that you are learning right now that is has improved your songwriting techniques? No. So right now I'm, I'm currently writing on the, working on the second book in, in this series. And uh, this one is going to be much more about the connection between songwriting and marketing. So I'm not not about marketing specifically and not about songwriting, but it's really about that intersection between the two. Because I'm really fascinated by um, musicians who manage to write songs that market themselves. And I'm really interested in in that aspect of it. And so that's what I'm, I'm researching most of right now. And I'm really fascinated by how personality can be expressed in musical ways. And that's something I'm, I'm, I'm really learning about a lot about right now. So... Um, for example, there's um, uh, a system called the Big Five in psychology, um, where we look at five personality traits, um, and it's called Ocean because it's that stands for openness to experience, um, conscientiousness. Um, then we have E, which is uh, extroversion. Uh, then we have A, which is agreeableness, and N is uh, neurosity. Nu is that is that the word? Uh, if you're um, yeah, I think that's the right one. Neurosity, like root word being neurotic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those are the five personality traits and they, they both have like um, different extremes. And it's, it's really funny because I, in the book I, or in the new book, I describe it sort of as five faders that we can sort of set depending on the situation. And that's what I'm, what I'm really fascinated by is like, you can really set these faders and say, which artist is that? And it's often possible to tell just by how the faders are set, how the, how the personality is set, so to say. You can often tell who the, who the artist is. And so, for example, someone like um, Ed Sheeran, I think has really managed to 
become so successful because he managed to blend his personality and his image together. Like it's, it's one and the same thing. It's really hard to say where his personality ends and his image starts because they are so close to one another. And I think a lot of people overestimate what an image really is. People think it seems to like you have to act to be a certain way, but that's really not what it's about. It's really finding what you're interested in and turning that, you know, again, putting that into a girdle, making that a little bit easier to swallow for people, you know? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, in, you know, in, in my world and the way I'm teaching something similar to this, it's, I mean, we can sum it, summarize it up in a couple of different words. One of them would be um, brand because that should encompass personality, your imagery, your mu the music itself, the culture around your music and the type of person drawn to it. Um, so for me, what I strive for is congruency congruency between you know the my my facebook cover image to my album covers to my all the images on my instagram profile if you just go to my instagram profile and you just start scrolling you should get a, a very good idea of who i am what i'm all about what my culture is within three to five seconds really you should and then from there carry all the way through to my merchandise and my email marketing and all of it there should be congruency so uh, yeah, that's that's another way to summarize it is personality, exactly. brand, yeah. Because we want to have the feeling that we're talking to you as a person. Like we want to have that experience with you. We want to have a, a unique experience when we listen to your music and not just listen to your music, but wear your merch or sign up to your newsletter. We want to feel like we're talking to you because it's all about, it's still all about connection. It's all about character, you know? We want to get in touch with people that we think are cool. That's really what it comes down to in the end, you know? Like our favorite musicians are also our heroes. It's not just the music, it's the people behind the music. Because we think like, hey, these, these guys understand me. They write songs that directly speak to me. And also something I wanna say, something that I really discovered a couple of weeks ago that I think is really fascinating is, because I, I wondered how bands like say 21 Pilots or Radiohead fit into this kind of formula, into this kind of frame. And I think they do in that what their message seems to be pure creativity and we don't let any formulas hold us down, basically. And so that becomes their formula, saying like, hey, we're going to defy your expectations. And that's what it's all about. You know, every music video is going to be a completely different location. We're going to change things around. We're going to wear different things. With the, maybe the fonts are different. The colors are going to be different. The, the emotion is going to be the same. And you know, it's us because you see the same guys in the videos. And we're incredibly creative. And that creativeness has a certain stamp on it. And that's that's enough to tie all the, all the products together. But I think that's really fascinating. So it's, if you're thinking that an image is gonna hold you down creatively, that's not necessarily true. It really depends on who you are as a person. If you are a super creative person who's all about creating things and about pushing the boundaries, that's, that can be an image, you know? Anything is possible in this world. Yeah, that's a good point too. I mean you're setting the expectation that things are going to be constantly changing in Radiohead's case, for example, uh, there's other bands that do this as well. Uh, and we're basically expect the unexpected and we might even go dark on social media for three years and you might not even hear from us and then boom out of nowhere, there'll be like a black image somewhere, <laughs> something blank. Yeah. And you're just like, Oh my gosh. And they generate all this buzz just because they made some mysterious post and that's part of their culture and part yeah. of their their image and part of their personality like you said so it's really but i think the the difference between them and artists who are struggling right now is clear intentions and purpose behind what they're doing i mean they thought these, i mean it probably took them the three years to come up with the black image that they just posted <laughs> to figure <laughs> out how are they going to deploy this mysterious you know uh press move so uh and and what is all following that they didn't just put post something mysterious and then that was it i mean they have a whole campaign coming after that exactly. so it's all about the message yeah exactly yes and the intentionality behind it so um you know you're you're also a coach you you work with songwriters what are some of the before and afters that you have seen when working with people on their techniques? Can you tell me about uh, anybody in particular or uh, just an instance where you just saw such a transformation in their overall um, artistry or songwriting after using your techniques? 
So I had a couple of people who um, were signed to record companies, um, a couple who were signed to um, publishers and stuff like that. I've also worked with a couple of bands, even though that's something I do very little of, unfortunately, even though I do quite enjoy it. But I've worked with a band um, called the Black Proteus. And um, I mean, there's, they're still working it. They're in their first kind of, in their first year, they just released their first EP. And um, I think they're doing really good work though. Um, so we worked on, so they're kind of um, alternative rock band. Um, and uh, what we worked on together, for example, was making their visuals look a little bit more like they were sounding because it was all still a little bit too, too many different things. You know, they, they were very congruent with the images that they were using. They just didn't fit the music. And so it's things like that. Um, I also said like, you know, who are you talking to when you're, when you're writing this music? So I have this thing where my main focus when I'm, when I'm marketing music, if you want to even call it that, because I don't think of it that way, um, is I'm always thinking about who am I writing this for? Who's the person who's going to listen to this and, who, and who's going to enjoy it? And is that a person, and that's the most important question for me, is that a person that I'm going to like in my life? Is that someone who I want to be around, you know? So for a while, for example, I wrote uh, hip hop songs and um, for, for a certain, and, and I thought about this, the certain, the, the audience that I was writing for. And I thought, you know what, that's not actually the people I want to have more of in my life um, for myself personally. And um, the same thing went for realistic songwriting, for example, I thought about, and what is the kind of songwriter that I want to speak to here? And I, for me, it was, I want to talk to people who have at least written a hundred songs already. They're now willing to take that next step. And so all my material is targeted at those kind of people. And so for the Black Proteus, I said like, so who's your audience? Who are the people that you want to attract into your life? And for them, it was people who grew up during the same time as they did. So um, late eighties, early nineties, uh, that listened to the same bands as them. So bands like, you know, Bush or, um, you know, even early Fall Out Boy and stuff like that. And um, I said like, how can we speak to those people a little bit more? Maybe we can find a nostalgia factor. and um, how can we make it look a little bit more like those days, like the grunge era, you know, which was very imperfect. And I said, you know, you know what? So we, we started working on their production. We started working on their image, imagery and uh, we started working on their general artwork. So for example, I, I said to them, you know, the music needs some more dirty elements. It's too clean. Everything is a little bit too, too perfect. It needs a little bit more dirt if you want it to sound a little bit more 90s. Um, the images are too clean. The colors, black and white, is a little too simple. There needs to be some ugly colors. It needs to be a little bit ugly if you want to speak to that audience, if you want that nostalgia factor, for example. Um, so it's things like that. You know, I'm really, I'm really trying to figure out what it is that the band is trying to do, and I'm trying to get behind that and try to push that up to the max. It's not, I'm, I'm trying not to apply my my own mindset to what they're doing. I'm trying to find what they're already doing and what they're interested in and what they're communitively, um, what they've come up with and try to find a thing about that and magnify that a little bit for people to understand them better. I think that's, that's probably the best summary of my process. Yeah, that's great. Can you give me an example really quick of how image and music could be incongruent and how that could possibly confuse an audience? Sure. So for example, you could have, um, it would be, let's, let's just give you an example. Like it would be weird if Ed Sheeran started singing death metal. It would be weird if um, Beyonce started doing um, German Schlager, you know, it's just, it's really simple like that. It's, I mean, those are extreme examples, of course, but you have to also look at yourself for this kind of thing. A lot of people are trying to be someone that they're just not. Like, I mean, you look a certain way, that's what you're born with. I mean, you can change that to a certain degree, of course. Um, and you can, you know, dye your hair, or add makeup or wear certain clothes to, to change a little bit who you are. But it's really gonna, it's gonna be very, very tough for a skinny white kid to do some gangster rap, you know? It's gonna be really difficult. So it's, a lot of it has to, has to do with really looking at yourself and trying to figure out like, what kind of attitude do I bring to the table? Uh, not just through my looks, but really through the performance and through uh, the songs that I write and through the lyrics as well. The lyrics are a big part of it for sure as well, um, because that's 
there we really get into personality in, in, in songwriting is what are you saying with your lyrics? What kind of message are you literally saying in your songs? And if that is incongruent with how you look or um, yeah, how your music video looks or how your artwork looks, how your music sounds, then that's a, a big problem potentially. Yeah, a couple of, of thoughts that I had was you're saying that um, with my artwork, my goal is, the goal is, this is like the ultimate, is if someone can look at my artwork without hearing my music and know exactly what it is. For me, that's a huge win. If someone can be like, I got it. I know what it is before I even heard it. That, that for me, that is the ultimate success. That and is exactly so, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you I totally have that with your artwork. I completely know what you mean because I ne immediately knew what it was going to sound like before I even, because I, I, I listened to some of your music and just clicking on the thumbnail, I, I already knew what this was going to be. And I hadn't read anywhere before that you did Celtic Metal. It just totally made sense. Everything was just one thing it, screaming at me like, this is what this is, you know, being very clear about um, its identity. Okay, okay, cool. I'm going to throw a curveball at you here. Uh, someone like me, I, I could definitely be a little more intentional with my lyric writing, but I'll tell you, my technique is that I have no technique in that it's, uh, I guess, what you call intuitive lyric writing, where I'm just literally, you know, babbling whatever happens to come out, whatever vowels and whatever feels right. Then I try to formulate that into words and see if I see a theme emerging. If I see a theme emerging, then I start sometimes having to rack my brain. Sometimes I end up on, end up on Wikipedia and like pulling out keywords and things like that. It's a little bit of a word salad, really. Um, and then I try to, you know, refine it and make it a little more purposeful. But, you know, what do you think about, what's your opinion on intuitive lyric writing and can that work in a commercial setting or is that like a huge no-no? I mean, I've, I've worked with both. Um, I, think, I think what people are underestimating is how much of an emotional punch those kind of lyrics still can have. I mean, first of all, you have the factor that it fits the melodies typically very well because you're coming up with just the vowels and, and kind of sounds for your melody that go really well together. And then you're finding words to that. So, the, so the, the melody comes first. And if melody's first, that typically means you're going to have a very strong melody. And secondly, if you, if you go around trying to find these words, what I call power words, words that are just really interesting and unique to your song, that adds a certain emotional um, component to your song. You know? um, even if your song isn't specifically about something, I think oftentimes the, the songs that touch me most are the songs that have no logical meaning, that are just... Sometimes they're just words, but words that kind of come from the same realm, from the same universe. You can tell, like, for example, I think Bush is a really good example of this. Um, let me just pull up a lyric here by Bush. Say, um, what is that called? Um, glycerine? Let's do that one. So, must be your skin that I'm sinking in. Must be for real, because now I can feel... And I didn't mind, it's not my kind, it's not my time to wonder why. Everything's gone white and everything is gray. Now you're here, now you're away. You know, that's just, and the so chorus- So abstract. Is, yeah, and don't let the days go by, glycerine, glycerine is the chorus, you know? Um, but when we rise, it's like strawberry fields. It's just, it, it's really abstract. It doesn't make a lot of sense logically, but emotionally it makes a whole lot of sense because there's, fragments of lyrics in there where I'm like, oh, I understand this. That makes a lot of sense to me. And someone else will say like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. And logically it doesn't, but there's every once in a while, there's a bit of genius hidden in that. A certain phrase that you haven't heard before that, that makes you go, oh, that's new. That's weird. That's interesting. Um, and that becomes part of your image as well. You know, it's, I mean, you didn't come up, come up with those words out of the blue. They, you sorted them. You still figured out which words to use. And I think your lyrics, because I saw a lyric video of, a lyric video of you as well, um, the lyrics fit your music. It's not like you're using words that have no place in that whatsoever. I mean, you're not singing about McDonald's and, I don't know, cheeseburgers. It's, it's, it all fits together. You know, you understand that subconsciously. That's something it's almost impossible to do wrong. Yeah, sometimes my fans are asking me what the song is about, and I just have to tell them, you know, it's more of a theme. I, for me, actually, I... I tend to write lyrics visually, like I'm seeing a picture in my head and I'm just trying to find words to express the emotion of the picture I see in my head. It's not a specific scene like out of a book and it's not like I'm writing 
to someone uh, and they're not like, it's not a descriptive song where in the typical storytelling sense. And exactly. so I, I always say I'm a theme lyric writer. And, and in, in, I think the, the prose in that is that it's broad enough, it's vague enough that it could mean a variety of things depending on the listener and that they can kind of apply it to whatever they think it applies to, as opposed to, uh, I guess the cons of it are that, you know, sometimes there could be better storytelling in it that, than I currently have. So I think that, you know, there's always areas to improve. I could definitely spend more time writing my lyrics, but I'll say most of the time it's literally coming from my gut or emotions in this intuitive vowel sounding, finding themes kind of a, a, a style. So um, yeah, it's really interesting. You know, what I, what I will say though about this is um, something where people do go wrong if they use this approach in my experience is that the words that they're using aren't strong enough. So if you, if you are using this um, improvised emotional approach to lyric writing, I think it is important that you're using words that convey a certain emotion. So I think um, maybe glycerin wasn't the best example uh, because it doesn't have, and I, it doesn't speak to me that strongly if I just read it like this here. Um, I think the chorus is strong with, by using the word glycerin, which just feels completely out of place. But what I like about lyrics like that is when they use strong emotional words that we haven't seen anywhere else before. So um, I think, uh, let me just pull up another one by this. And that would be a great exercise too for writing email subject lines <laughs> because exactly. it has um, to provoke some kind of an emotion for people to even be interested to open and read it. Absolutely. Um, so here's a good example, uh, Swallow. This was the song I tried to, um, tried to find earlier. So this is the, the, the first verse is warm sun, feed me up. I'm leery, loaded up, loathing for a change, and I slip some, boil away. You know, that's, again, super abstract, but the words he's using I th and, and the way he's combining them, I think, creates a lot of interest. And that's what I find really fascinating about this approach. And I think if you're using, if you are using this approach, then it's really important that the words you're using are specific and sort of have a, a callback of a certain um imagery in your listener. That's, I think, really, really important. And that can be different for everyone. You don't have to explain what they're supposed to think about or what they're supposed to see in their, in their mind's eye. But it's really important to give them some very specific words that remind them of a specific event in their life. Um, and I think folk is really great at that. Um, there's a, a bunch of uh, electronic artists that do something like this as well. Uh, and grunge, of course. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, I think, something I, I still wanted to mention. If you're using this approach, it doesn't mean like it's hand off, hands off and you can just write whatever. I think there are still ways to do it, to make it better by, by using these power words and finding as many as possible of them and trying to find interesting combinations of words, not just, um, you know, the phrases that we've heard too many times in our lives, like uh, I'm fading away and, and metal is a good example. It's like there's these phrases and my heart and soul and used to be a thing in pop, you know, um, um, there's these phrases that are so worn out that they cliche. can, really, yeah, they can really kill a song. So stay away from the cliche stuff. Try to do things. So what I get, you know, the book called Purple Cow, mm -hmm. the marketing book. Seth um, Godin? So, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So, yeah. So we got to have more purple cows in our songwriting, which is basically the, you know, the theory of standing out and in something we call a pattern interrupt where you know people are scrolling through their feeds or whatever and all of a sudden just something just jumps out at you and you're just you can't help but pay attention just like if you were driving down the road and you saw all these farms and then all of a sudden you just saw a purple cow in a field like you would literally be like parking the car going what the heck is that yeah and and so i can see i mean what you're saying just is perfectly correlates with traditional successful marketing practices is have more purple cows in your lyrics, just like words that stand out that invoke emotion, but are also different that they're not hearing these cliche things all the time. So yeah, great. Absolutely. Great. I, mean, I mean, modern marketing is really about relationship building, right? That's really what it's about. There's no foot in the door marketing anymore. That stuff doesn't work anymore because we have too many options with the internet. Exactly. So relationship, relationship building is marketing. And so if you're building a relationship through your song, through those words, then you are also marketing, which is exactly what I'm interested in with that intersection. So musicians, you can't get away from it. You yeah. are marketing whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the cool thing is you already are marketing. You just don't know it. You can be good at it or bad at it, but you are doing it. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Can you, uh, I have one last question for you. Do you ever, we talked about kind of uh, writing for someone specific. I call that person basically the, a fan avatar. So it's just like, I almost create a character in my mind. You know, this is the person, you know, male, female, maybe I'll create a variation of both of them. This is their age range. These are their interests. These are the blogs they read. These are the Facebook pages they subscribe to. This is where they shop. These are the bands they like. This is what their day looks like. I really flesh this out in, in our programs as well. Um, and do you find that people then, let's say you've got this avatar in mind or this audience in mind, do you find that sometimes songwriters are getting caught up in feeling like they can't write to an avatar and that that's holding them? Like if they, if they do it, they feel like they're selling their soul a little bit or that they're, they're getting more into like a commercial headspace and that yeah. they're abandoning their, their artistry when, so how do you get them? I'm, I'm assuming that, yes, this is a problem. This is a common, maybe an obstacle that people have to overcome. And how do you move them into a synergism with that? So for me, it's really clear for me. I have two different avatars. One is for my marketing. Once, once the product is done and during the writing process, my avatar is me. I'm just writing for myself. Cause I mean, ideally both av avatars are similar anyways, but since I don't know exactly what my, avid, my, my actual fan is going to be thinking about my music, I, don't, I have no clue about knowing what their background is or what they think about this certain technique that I'm using. I'm just going to rely on myself because I say like, you know, I'm, I'm a child of my experience. Like I've, you know, I've lived through the world probably similar than, than my ideal fan has. So I have similar experience. I have experiences. I have similar mindsets, similar backgrounds. And so... I'm just trying to write for myself. If it works for me, and if it, if it gets re me really excited, then that's a really good sign for me. And it's the songs where, where I felt like I had to cater to some uh, imaginary avatar in the writing. I'm making this very clear. It's in the writing process that the songs really have gone wrong. So for, for me, as a, in the creative process, it's absolutely Im imperative for me to just write for myself. And to, but also, I'm, I'm looking at myself objectively, thinking like, what do, I what do I think of this? How does this make me feel? And I'm constantly asking myself these questions. It's not just like that I'm, that, that I'm working and like, oh, that was fun. But I'm, I'm really trying to figure out what it is that I'm experiencing in the moment. And I go back through my song and listen to the whole thing uh, every once in a while and, and try to experience it as if it was the first time that I was hearing the song and try to figure out like, how would I react to this if this was the first time listening to this? What, was, what would be my experience with this? And I'm trying to make that first experience as great as possible. Okay. And then do you flip more to, now let me put myself in the shoes of the avatar that I would like to reach. Are you doing that more in the production phase and just kind of leaving that out of the, the creative phase? Or do you, like at what point does, will this work for this brand that I've built, so this music brand, and for this audience that I'm reaching, at what point are you really considering that? When You mean when it's going to flip from uh, myself to the ex external avatar? Um, exactly. For me, for me, it's really when the song is done. Like when I have a finished MP3 on my computer, that's when the song is done. So anything that, um, that leads into that is for me, it, I'm just writing for myself. I'm doing, doing that for myself. And I mean, there are certain standards that I appear, uh, appear to, of course, like, for example, it has to sound professional. I, I want all the instruments to sound good and stuff. Um, and there are certain things that, like I, for example, I, I really don't have a pro problem with a really imperfect kind of muddy sound. Like um, you heard me mention Bush. They have a really very loose kind of production. Like it's, it sounds like they were just recorded in the rehearsal room. And I like that as well. And I, I still have those rules for myself that I say like, no, that's not what I want to do. Maybe on another album, but for this album, I have these, I've set these rules for myself. I want it to sound a certain quality. I want it to sound larger than life. You know, I, I might set these rules for myself in the beginning of the, of the process. So I, I do have a certain, um, a certain structure to everything. But um, once I have followed all of those points, then it's really all about like, how how does it touch me and what's the emotion that I'm having as I'm experiencing this? And since my writing process and my production process are typically one and the same, so I'm writing directly in my DAW. So I'm not writing on my guitar and later record it. And, um, you know, it's not two separate steps for me. I'm a producer as well. So all of that is just one big creative thing. 
Um, I do the same thing also. Yeah. I find that because like, if you come up with an idea, you don't want to have to remember it. It <laughs> just, sometimes exactly. there's a magic that can be captured right there in the moment. And you, and it's never the same again, even when you go to, you know, if it's a, if it's a scratch track, I found that when you go to record the real thing later, it's sometimes it just never gets that magic that you initially had for whatever reason. It's a mystery in life to me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's when it flips, like when I'm done with the song, that's when I think about, okay, now we're done with that part. Now it's time to think about this logically and, and, uh, and try to figure out who this is actually for and how we can, we can find people like me, you know, cause that's when it's, when it's not no longer about me, it's no, um, but it also helps me when I'm marketing because it, cause it's basically what I'm telling my audience is I wrote a song that I think is the bomb. I think it's the coolest song that was ever written in the entire universe. And I hope you guys are going to like it. Like if you can come to people with that approach, that's great. I mean, it's much better than saying like, hey, I wrote a song that I think you guys will like. I think it's just really strong saying like, hey, I have no idea about you, but to me, this is the coolest thing ever. And I'm super excited about sharing it with you guys. I really like that approach. And it also feels more genuine, more authentic. And like, you're not just there trying to please a crowd. You know, you're there to be an artist and create the, the emotion and the art that's inside of you. And then you're releasing it to the people that connect with you. And as you said, this whole thing is about relationships. And especially if you want to succeed today, you can't have, you can't hide behind a wall of mystique. You can't try to have some celebrity uh, profile where you are disconnected from them. Gone are those days. Gone is that mentality. So to be able to come to them and say, uh, you know, I, this is a vulnerable thing for me. <laughs> I'm like, where it's like wearing your heart on your sleeve. Here you go. You might hate it. You might troll me. I don't know what is going to happen, but I hope you like it. I did it for me and I hope you like it uh, along with me and hope we can share this together. I think that's so powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's that honesty, that frag fragility um, that I think people really um, get addicted to. It's really, if you can show people a, a, a true side of yourself, a side that it's not saying I'm trying to, trying to make something that the charts like, or I'm trying to make something that I think you will like, you know, people can always sense that it's like, it's like the marketer that, that, you know, the foot in the door approach. It's people trying to convince you of something instead of just saying like, Hey, this is what it is. I'm proud of it. What do you think? Yeah. Fantastic, man. This has been really great. I'm learning a lot from you just through this conversation and through your book. It's, it's stuff that I know I'm going to apply in my next album and I'm going to keep all these things in mind. And uh, I highly encourage everyone to go and get that book, The Addiction Formula by Friedman. And I won't butcher your last name again. <laughs> but Finn Dyson, did I get it? It's Friedemann Finn Dyson, but Finn Dyson. Gets that wrong. It's, Finn it's Dyson. I, I know. Probably, I should have found another pseudonym, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And is there anywhere else that you would like people to connect with you other than just YouTube and the book? Um, well, if you like my stuff on YouTube and if you like the book, and those I think are the first two things that I recommend you check out. I also have a couple of courses on my website, holisticsongwriting.com, uh, whether that's with a dash or without, both are fine. Um, and I have a Patreon page where every week I do a live stream uh, analyzing people's songs and answering questions. So if you're interested in that, that's patreon.com slash holistic songwriting without a dash. So holistic songwriting, all one word. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Oh, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. Cool. Hope so. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And I have some exciting news for you. If you have been wanting to know how you can crack the code of Spotify and increase your listeners and your monthly followers so that you can create a regular stream of income. This is going to be so exciting. Join the wait list and be the first to know when our new Spotify mini course is live. Go to SavvyMusicianAcademy.com forward slash Spotify. That's SavvyMusicianAcademy.com forward slash Spotify and sign up for the wait list and we will email you as soon as that mini course is live. This is going to be so exciting. I'm very proud to present this to you. This is unlike any other teaching out there and I promise it's going to be worth it. Thanks again for listening today and we'll see you soon.